Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore thoughts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. Uh, I'm Parker Sedicase. I'm your host, and I know it's pronounced Ponces, but I'm an American swine, so I say Pensies. Uh, I have a really special guest with me today. Uh, I have with me Dr. Jonathan Schaffer, and we're going to be talking about metaphysical grounding and how we can use grounding relations to help us make sense of different ideas in philosophy of mind, particularly uh, what Dr. Schaffer is called grounding functionalism. So it's going to be a really fun episode. I'm really stoked to have him on. Before we jump in, though, I want to thank everyone over on Patreon for making this happen. You guys are awesome. Uh, if you like this show, if you benefited from it, if it's in your top five, your top 10, please consider becoming a Patreon patron. And you can support the show monthly. Um, you can find a link in the description and you can find all sorts of different goodies, stickers and mugs and all sorts of stuff at different levels of support over on Patreon. You can also get early access to episodes, uh, see them before everyone else. That would be huge. Um, so please consider becoming a patron. Another way you can support me though is to check out my sponsor, uh, Biblios Clothing Company. I'm wearing one of the shirts right now. Uh, it's awesome. They have a lot of really cool designs. They just started. A good friend of mine and his wife uh, and it, for a limited time, if you go over to biblioscloathingcompany.com, uh, you can get a 10% discount off your total order uh, by just typing in my link or finding my link in the description. The link is biblioscloathing.com slash discount slash Parker, all caps. You can get 10% off your entire order. So go check them out and support me by supporting them. Let, let, me, uh, let them know that I sent you by following that link. Uh, so there's two good ways to support me. Please consider doing one or both. All right. So now without further ado, let's bring in Dr. Schaffer and get going on grounding. Dr. Schaffer, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. Hey, thanks, Parker. Thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to discussing all this stuff with you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Me too. So you're a distinguished professor of philosophy at Rutgers. And you're in, in the circles I run, you are a, a legend for the grounding stuff that you've done and, and the revolution that you've you've been a part of if not started in metaphysics really quick before we get in um how'd you get into philosophy in general and then maybe how, how'd you come to um specialize in metaphysics well i got into philosophy because uh, my mom always says that she swore that she would never tell her kids do it because i told you so but mm. would always give reasons and so my sister and i early on learned to argue back much to my mom's chagrin. And I think that, that started me on the path wow. of philosophy because so much of what we do is about sort of debating various views. Yeah. So uh, then when I got to grad school, I was uh, sorry, when, excuse me, when I was an undergrad, I was uh, had, a, had a great life plan of I was gonna be a lawyer. And uh, there was this one philosophy course, I needed to find an extra course on my schedule. Mm -hmm. so fine, I'll, I'll go in there, I'll, I'll teach them all a thing or two. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was just amazed by it and it captivated uh, by it ever since. Wow. So then um, there, there's so many different fields you could have gone into in, in uh, subdisciplines of philosophy. Uh, how'd you get in, into metaphysics? Oh yeah, right. Um, so I didn't really have a particular sort of subfield direction. Mm -hmm. uh, when I went to grad school, I was actually thinking I might, might do logic. And then I kind of, uh, I sort of came across David Lewis and his work really was inspiring to me. And I was just, just blown away by um, his, the, 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 the breadth of his vision and the clarity of his writing. And I just kind of kind of ran with that. Awesome. Well, so uh, the history of philosophy is tricky, I know, and, and there's uh, different, the history of ideas is a different thing. than when I think of David Lewis, I think here's someone who came through and kind of cracked uh, the logical positivist uh, framework and said, no, we're going to go into lots of crazy stuff and, and we're going to build worlds. And, um, and then I kind of think of you being downstream of that and saying, hey, we're going to get rid of well, we're not get rid of, but we're, here's a different way to look at metaphysics, not this uh, Quinean model, but uh, let's go back to Aristotle. And so I kind of, I see you in that same kind of trajectory. Um, what, what'd you end up, what'd you do your dissertation uh, on? Uh, so I did my dissertation on causation, on sort of counterfactual accounts of causation. And nice. uh, I mean, I was at Rutgers and uh, Lewis was, was at Princeton, of course, mm -hmm. but he was my outside examiner. So oh, I, wow. Okay connect with him about uh, thinking about causation. It was an amazing wow. experience. 
That's fantastic. Did you give him a incredulous stare, or or <laughs> did you kind of did you adopt any of any of Lewis's um, model there? I, I gave him more uh, awestruck <laughs> glances. Um, uh, you know, he, he. I would come to his. I would try to come to his office sometimes and and talk philosophy with him. But I, I soon came to understand that he was actually someone. He didn't sort of chat very naturally or very easily. Hmm. So uh, he was someone who was. Uh, you got the best of David Lewis on the page or through writing letters. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, uh, that's very cool. Well, um, I want to get into to grounding. Um, and maybe we can just we can go we can start with the the goal of metaphysics because you've you've written this in very influential paper on what grounds what and for the listeners if you guys can get a hold of that definitely do that it's in the book meta metaphysics which is just a fantastic title um but yeah maybe you can you can help us think through the quinean model and then maybe like aristotelian or neo aristotelian what what you're what you've been working on just by starting off with what what's the true goal of metaphysics all right okay so um True goal of metaphysics is a little tricky because you know metaphysics is on one hand it's sort of a um, uh, an intellectual um, project that's been inhabited by lots of different people with different things in mind. Um, but uh, maybe we can just talk about what would sort of what I would consider to be the sort of most interesting intellectual questions in the vicinity of a lot of traditional metaphysical questions. That sounds great. So um, there's this. Um, you know, you, Parker, you were talking earlier about how sort of Lewis was part of this revival of metaphysics. Um, and there's this sort of tradition going back through Quine, um, who's one of Lewis's teachers at Harvard, of um, revi uh, a sort of reviving metaphysics, but in on the understanding of metaphysics as concerned with what exists. Mm. So in Quine's famous on what there is, he says that the, you know the the big question of metaphysics is what exists, and you can answer that in a single word, which is everything, and that just rem mm. remains to debate over particular cases. Um, so uh, definitely, um, when I was working, when I sort of started off in metaphysics, that was the, that Quinean view was the received view. Like there is this viable research program, and its goal is to say what exists. And there are the like, controversial cases would be things like numbers. You know, is there such a thing as the number two or yeah. you know, uh, properties? Is there like the universal redness? Is that a is that something that exists? Um, so that's uh, so the Quinean program is about looking at these controversial cases and trying to say whether a given entity exists or not. And then there's a sort of a method baked into that of looking to our best theories and seeing what has to be in the kind of domain of discourse that you need to get our best theory to come out true. Yeah. And uh, what struck me as dissatisfying about that kind of approach, missing in that kind of approach, is at the end of the day, the quinine is just going to give you a big list of what there is, or maybe a small list, uh, some list. Of yeah. what, it's like the telephone directory of the world that just, hmm. you know, just lists every entity. But a mere list doesn't yet tell you anything explanatory about why certain things exist. It might tell you that, say, numbers exist, maybe, but it wouldn't tell you why they do. It wouldn't tell you whether numbers are fundamental entities or whether their existence is explained through anything deeper. Mm -hmm. And it struck me that the most interesting metaphysical questions weren't just, I mean, it's interesting to know what exists, yeah. but it seems to me much deeper and richer and more intellectually satisfying to also try to say why certain things exist. And the kind of background picture that I have in mind in addressing questions of why certain things exist is this idea that some some entities are fundamental mm -hmm. uh, and they just th there's no deeper reason why they exist they're just there and yeah. maybe what's fundamental maybe it's just particles in space-time maybe some will think it's a god or you know there's various candidates I some will think that it's the whole, the cosmos as a whole. That's the kind of monistic view that I go in for. Lots mm -hmm. of options, but there's there some things are fundamental, and other things exist in virtue of 
what the fundamental reality is like. So, so entities like you and I and tables and chairs, they exist, but there's a reason why they exist. They're not fundamental. They exist because of how the particles are arranged or perhaps because of you know, uh, the will of God or the, the, uh, the structure of the cosmos or something like that. Yeah. Um, and so, so one thought is that these grounding, uh, richer Aristotelian questions bring in a kind of explanatory richness that was missing from the Quinean program. Mm -hmm. A second and connected thought, if you don't mind me going on, please, I'll, I'll please continue, yeah. is that a lot of these Quinean questions, I think, turn out to be actually fairly trivial on examination. So like the case of numbers was supposed to be one of the big ones, like do numbers exist? Mm -hmm. But there's actually like a some pretty hard to answer arguments uh, for the conclusion that numbers exist. Hmm. So is there a number between four and six? Uh, hard to say no to that. Right? <laughs> right. If there's a number between four and six, then there's a number. Or, you know, hmm. are there prime numbers less than 10? Again, like hard to say no to that one. Yeah. But if there are prime numbers less than 10, then there are numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so we get these like kind of fairly trivial, but like equally like like seemingly knockdown arguments for the existence of numbers. So it seems to me that if there is an interesting metaphysical question in the vicinity, this is getting back to where I was saying like, we should look for interesting intellectual questions in the vicinity. Yeah. The interesting question in the vicinity of the numbers question is, are numbers fundamental? Mm. Or is their existence to be explained by anything deeper? Maybe something about the structure of things or the structure of our minds or who knows? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what was really encouraging in, in reading uh, on what grounds what. And I think that is kind of a, a nod to uh, on what exists, right? It's a similar type of uh, wordplay in the in the titles, there, which, I, which I appreciated. But it's not just, hey, do these things exist? Uh, yeah, they do. But in what way? Are, are they grounded in something deeper, more fundamental? And I thought that was really helpful. Um, just a, Sorry, this is just a, a random question, but um, I'm used to people saying quantify over. So like we, in an indispensability argument or something, we, we quantify over um, propositions or, or mathematical numbers. And now I've heard a lot of people say range over. Is, is quantify over and range over, is that the same thing? Or is there these different senses or something? Well, let's say, I mean, a quantifier will range over certain mm. entities in the domain of discourse. Okay. Um, so I guess the way that I'm thinking about it, this is kind of a standard um, model theoretic semantic treatment, okay. is associated with um, you, have a, you have a model for interpreting uh, uh, sentences, uh, and that model comes with a domain. And that domain, usually given by a set, you can do it with just a plurality. Let's just say a set for, for present purposes. It's a set of entities. Okay. And then a uh, the quantifier, if they say like, you know, you know, you know ev everything is, so, you know, everything is a table, take like a silly claim. Mm -hmm. So all, you regiment that as for all X, TX. Um, and then that X, that variable, is ranging over the entities in your domain of discourse. Mm. Uh, and those might be like all the things that there are. We could have the restricted domains that we're, we're just talking about all the things in the living room or something like that. Okay. Um, so I would say that the um, the uh, the quantifier, when, when, when we have a quantifier, we're quantifying over uh, uh, and the variables are ranging over, but it's really the domain where mm. the action is. And the domain is a set of entities. And um, even if we didn't have a language that had quantification, as long as we had a domain, uh, we've still got that set of entities in our semantics. Mm -hmm. And that's what the, the sort of what Quinians really, uh, what they, the they think that the ontology is, what we need in the domain mm -hmm. to make our sentences come out true. Wow, that, that's mm -hmm. really helpful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's really good. Um, well, another, another kind of a, a personal question for you. How did you have the guts to go in for neo-Aristotelian or Aristotelianism uh, in general, given the the history, given how how many Quinians were around, given that you know there's there's Lewis over here and he's doing something that's close but a little bit different in my mind, I think. How'd you have the courage to say, hey, now I'm gonna go in for 
let's go back to Aristotle and let's talk substance stuff. Uh, you know, it's funny to it's kind of you to put it that way. I mean, I, I just sort of wrote what I thought. Um, <laughs> nice. So to be honest, like I was already at that point in my career on record defending a, a monistic view in metaphysics. Mm -hmm. And that if there was, at least at the time when I was writing, if there was any view in sort of historical metaphysics that was treated with utter scorn and ridicule, <laughs> it was monism. Okay. So I was already like notorious, infamous, I don't know, as like the monist. Okay. <laughs> so with that, like, I was like, I had no reputation left to lose at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, um, so you said you go in for, uh, I believe it's priority monism, right? That's 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 what you call it. Uh, instead of the neo-human um, priority microphysicalism, uh, if I'm getting that right, does that does that sound right? Yeah, uh, so prior, so right. There's two different contrasts, Parker. Okay. Um, so prior, there's priority monism versus existence monism. Okay. Um, and, and existence monism is the view that only one entity exists, mm -hmm. and that's that's kind of a crazy view. That was what. Yeah. People thought monism must mean because they didn't have these ground theoretic priority notions in mind. Yeah. And this priority, going back to like the pre-Socratics and saying like all is fire or whatever, and they say that that's been that's crazy. Yeah. 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 Um, or yeah. Um, and then um, priority monism then is the view that there's only there's only one thing is fundamental. But there can be more things that they're just not fundamental. Yeah. So, for instance, uh, my version of it is that the cosmos is the one and only fundamental entity. And creatures like you and I, we exist, but we are dependent fragments of the cosmos. Yeah. A different a view that I think is also a, a priority monist view, uh, but that doesn't turn to the cosmos, would be a, a kind of theistic view that says that God is the one and only fundamental entity, uh, and that other things like you and I and tables and chairs, uh, they all exist, but they are uh, metaphysically dependent upon God. Uh, that yeah. would be a different, uh, that would also be um, a sort of a, a single fundamental entity. Um, but multiple derivative entities, uh, kind of, kind of idea. That's um, yeah. That's really interesting. I, haven't, I guess I haven't thought of of theism in those terms, but that that's really interesting. Um, and priority monism, are you? Are, is the cosmos the one substance, or can other deriv Can there be derivative substances out of the, the whole? Good. So. Um, it, there's a bit of a danger of a verbal dispute here because substance sometimes is taken to mean fundamental entity. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm very happy to say that there can be derivative objects, Okay, you and I. Whether a derivative object is worth calling a substance or not is a bit verbal. Um, okay. But uh, if you don't mind calling, I mean, we just have to decide whether substance means fundamental object, which is, I, I often use it that way as well. Okay. I'm having and hawing a little bit, <laughs> sure. right? but it, it, that's just verbal. We could use, we could just say a fundamental substance versus a non-fundamental substance. Okay. I say a substance versus an object. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's really, that's a really helpful clarification. Yeah. Um, uh, the, sorry, Please. the reason why I, sorry, that was a bit of a tangent because I, I was saying that we should contrast priority monism with existence monism. Yes, right. But then also, given uh, that there are a plurality of existences, so we're not existence monists, we mm -hmm. could still be priority monists and say there's only one fundamental one, or mm -hmm. we could be priority pluralists. Ah. This is the this is that kind of a uh, kind of neo humane view. This is a, the way that I re. It's not. Lewis didn't really have these ground theoretic notions. Uh, he, he was more skeptical about them. Mm -hmm. um, but this is the way you'd sort of read a kind of uh, Lewis's uh, Humean program through the lens of ground theory. Mm -hmm. You'd say that uh, it's the view that what's fundamental is just one little thing and then another, maybe like just particle by particle or space-time point by space-time point, something mm -hmm. like that. And then you'd say that the, um, the bigger... Uh, holes like tables and chairs and persons and stuff like that. They all exist, but they are dependent upon their parts. Okay. And so part of monism is, is kind of the opposing view. Instead of taking the smallest parts to be fundamental and building up the larger holes, it takes the largest hole to be fundamental and sort of carves out the smaller parts. Yeah. Um, do you, I can't, I read someone writing about you and they, they had said that you, 
uh, I can't remember if, if you did have room or you didn't consider it a viable option for like a priority macro physicalism that there are, you know, it, what do you, what do you take of that? Is there a legit um, middle, middle ground or is it kind of like now it's one or the other? Oh, definitely. There's a legit middle, middle ground in, in uh, certainly in logical space. Uh, and sure. there, there's even, you know, there's some views that some people have found attractive that say that middle, some certain middle sized things, maybe organisms, maybe persons yeah. have, have, have a fundamental status. I, I think that's, that's a super interesting view. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, in my own thinking, I've tended to treat, I mean, even in the examples I was actually just giving us, I've sort of assumed that persons are going to be derivative entities. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's also partly revealing my sort of physicalist background thinking sure. about persons. You might have a more like dualist notion of a person in which, in which there are like maybe souls or something that are sort of fundamental entities in the world. That, that would be more, I think, more amenable to this sort of uh, middle, middle size fundamental okay. stuff. Um, so I've tended to think that the, the views that I find most plausible in the vicinity either start with the tiniest bits mm. yeah. or the biggest hole, but you know, that, that's, uh, it's not forced. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's really interesting. Um, I think Ross Inman. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on. Yeah, that's name. who I was thinking of, actually. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I was that's like, what's his name? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. He's been on. We we talked uh, a little bit about that. I, I think he he even goes in. Uh, I thought he was a macro priority macro physicalist, but he I think he terms his sub just substance priority, and he says there's substances all the way throughout and that are fundamental. So, cool. yeah, different views. Um, yeah. How how is your project been received now um because from the circles i run in we're all like hey jonathan chaffer said this so we're safe we can follow him but i don't know how how you've been received you know in the in the academy outside that you know i'm probably the worst person to ask that because i'm in such <laughs> like a, a such a tricky epistemic position to judge sure. your own uh reception uh, mm -hmm. and it's not just me of course i should, I should right. really add like uh kit fine was yep. really a, a huge um if you'll pardon the pun, groundbreaker, um, uh, 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 Gideon Rosen as well, uh, uh, Fabrice Correa, Karen Bennett. There have been a number of people who've been hugely, you know, influential in the in sort of the revival of sort of ground theoretic notions. Okay. Um, I guess I, I, the way that it seems to me uh, is that when I started working on the grounding stuff. I thought I was this like wild rebel who had this like crazy view. Yeah. And then it seemed like a few years later that like everyone had the view and it was boring. Oh man. <laughs> uh, There's awesome. some famous thing about like, uh, like, like I say, like revolutionary ideas. Like first they get, they're like, uh, they're, they're sort of dismissed they're ignored and then they're like dismissed as crazy and then they're dismissed as obviously true. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I sometimes feel like the grounding stuff, people are like, oh, oh, it's crazy. And then like, oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I, but, you know, so I'm, like, yeah. Well, I came in downstream. So for me, I'm like, yeah, of, of course this seems, this seems right. Until I get to like, uh, like Philip Goff. And I see uh, what he's doing with panpsychism from a priority monist view. And I'm like, well, maybe it's still a little crazy. Maybe we, <laughs> uh, awesome. but it's fun. He's great. He's coming on later to talk about that. Oh, awesome. You're going to have a great time. You got to keep the crazy going a little bit. That's right. That's, That's right. Part of the fun of it. Totally. Um, I, mean, I, I should say, though, like there are still like very important skeptics. Mm -hmm. uh, also like Jessica Wilson, Thomas Hofweber, a, a, a lot of, I think, really excellent metaphysicians who are, um, who are skeptics in various ways about the grounding program. So I, it's still like a, a, a controversial matter how to, yeah. Yeah, whether it's okay. Okay. So I wanted to cover one more thing before we jump into ground functionalism, um, and that's uh, permissivism. And we've, we've already touched on it a, a little bit here and there, but maybe we could just, you could say what permissivism is and then how that's different than Quine and uh, Minong, because uh, I know that, you know, they had that that beef, and so some people say, "Well, this is just Minongianism, and uh, there's different ways of being, and we're all scared by this." So, could you help us out? Right. Yeah, definitely. So, the rough idea of permissivism, I'll, I'll state it, and then I'll contrast it with Quine and with Minong. The mm -hmm. rough idea of permissivism is that, at least for for all of the 
uh, contr allegedly controversial entities on Quine's list, like numbers and, and properties and propositions. Um, yeah, they all exist. Mm. Yes. Uh, in the one and only sense it exists. They're yeah. all, they're, they're all out there. They're all, they're, they're all, they're all known. Um, so this is, um, in a certain way, this is just an answer to Quine's question of what there is, which is mm. like, yeah, 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 <laughs> for, all, <laughs> for all the controversial cases. That's all. Yeah. Um, uh, where it um, diverges from Quine is from from Orthodox Quineanism. Even it's an answer to the Quine to Quine's question, but it's not the answer that Quineans have wanted to give because Quineans have been motivated by Occam's razor and the idea of of of, of a, a sort of an aesthetic taste for a desert landscape. Quine's yeah. phrase. So they've wanted, when possible, to uh, 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 eliminate entities, to, to say no, 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 to as many entities as they could get away with saying no to. Um, and so this is connected a bit to a different, uh, a, a different conception of um, uh, ontological economy yeah. um, that I think is I think of as tied into the ground theoretic program. This is what I call the laser. That's where we're kind of like a high tech upgrade to the razor. Yeah. So whereas the 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 razor says don't multiply entities without necessity, and that yeah. inspires people to try to get rid of entities. So the 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 laser uh, goes for this high tech distinction between fundamental and non fundamental entities, mm -hmm. and says oh, don't multiply fundamental entities without necessity. Yeah. But derivative entities, if you can derive them, they're a free lunch. Yeah. They're like concepts that you can define from your base primitive concepts. There's no problem adding in derivative, adding in defined concepts. Yeah. What you want to minimize is your conceptual primitives. So it's kind of the analog of, con of uh, I think, the right methodology for conceptual economy. Uh, so, so that's how permissivism differs from Quineanism. And it, that difference is very much tied in. Uh, in my, to my mind, in this um, potential shift from the razor to the laser as the apt methodology for ontological inquiry. Yeah. Um, and the way it differs from my nom, if, if I could, could do you want, can I, if I could just. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Is um, at least the way that I understand my nom is my nom draws a distinction between what exists, what subsists, and just what there is. So, like maybe you and I exist, but then um, if I have more calling, then things that like the Golden Mountain subsists. There's assuming there isn't actually a Golden Mountain out there, mm -hmm. and then there's even uh, contradictory entities like the Round Square or whatever. I think yeah, they, yeah. they merely are; they don't exist or subsist. I, mm -hmm. Apologies if I'm butchering mine on a little bit, but the the details aside, there are these sort of three realms of the existent, the subsistent, and just what there is that doesn't neither exists nor subsists. Um, and that I, I find mystifying. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, per, my permissivist doesn't draw those distinctions. She says that all these things like numbers and, and properties and propositions exist in the one and only sense of existence. Mm -hmm. So they're all just out there. There's no like subsistence existence distinction. Yeah. Yeah, that's really helpful. So yeah, existence is is equivocal, um, but but some things are just derivative and some things are are non derivative or fundamental. So uh, if we were to say like Bilbo Baggins, um, he he exists. Um, yeah, he exists. Sure, he exists, but not in the same way as a fundamental. Well, do do you have degrees? So like, would Bilbo exist maybe in my mind, and I exist uh, as a derivative of the fundamental cosmos? Uh so I'm happy to say that you exist as derivative, and I think Bilbo exists derivatively, maybe from Tolkien's creative activities or something like that. Okay. As a fictional character, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so and there can be chains like maybe. So let's let's just take let's just take um, the cosmos. Let's assume that's fundamental. Yeah. Tolkien and Bilbo. Mm -hmm. So you can say like uh, um, the cosmos grounds Tolkien and Tolkien ground Bilbo. So we have this chain. Mm -hmm. And if you want, you can associate um, something like degree structure. You might not have enough structure to get like numerical structure here, but you can say that like 
Tolkien has a higher degree of reality than Bilbo because he's lower down in the chain. Yeah. Um, uh, to me, that's a bit verbal. Uh, I'm happy to say, I, I, I myself just would say that they all exist. And okay. the existence is an all or nothing notion. But given that we have these chains, if you want to say the things, things that when when things are on a single chain, and one thing is lower on the chain than the other, then the lower thing exists with to a greater degree or has yeah. a greater degree of reality than the thing that's higher on the chain. We can talk that way. That, that, that's there's a consistent way of making sense of that way of speaking, if you like. Okay. It. Okay. Yeah. I know that's uh that's uh some people that I talk with want to bring back the the great chain of being. So yeah. that's a way you might be able to do it, folks. Um, yeah, that's that's really fascinating. Well, so uh, jumping in on ground functionalism, there, this is a, a paper that's that's uh, a chapter in Oxford Studies in Philosophy of Mind, and there's a lot of, it's not quite like chisming, but there's a lot of like definitions and i don't know if we'll be able to cover all of them but um i think we can if we just kind of jump in on ground functionalism and then you can fill in the blanks where you need to um right. but before we do that can you just help us to find functionalism for those who are, are maybe unaware yeah so functionalism the root idea is that there's a connection between a mental state and a certain kind of pattern of uh causes and effects or inputs and outputs. So think about a mental state like pain. Uh, and according to the functionalist, there's an important correlation, and we'll have to get clear on what that correlation means because that's yes. a lot of the action is there. There's an important correlation between the mental state, pain, and its typical causes and effects. So let's just say this is totally oversimplified. Let's just say that pain is typically caused by tissue damage, and typically has the effect of making people say, of making you say "ouch." Mm -hmm. not, not a very serious scientific theory, but just a toy to play with. Sure. So, so we're thinking that the functional profile of pain is um, the state that's causally in between tissue damage and saying "ouch." Mm -hmm. And then the idea there is that um, that's can be potentially helpful to a physicalist because we might locate a state that's causally in between receiving tissue damage and saying, ouch, in a state of the central nervous system. I guess people use C fiber firing. Yeah, it's always C fiber. It's not, it's not really empirically accurate, but whatever. Right. We're going to say, uh, sure. so we can just, so there'll be going to be, so, and this this program and that uh, people talk about in terms of the neural correlates of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that the the right sort like, let's say we want to, and this is like the talk of neural correlates of consciousness is very ontologically neutral. Mm -hmm. We're not even saying like it might be that consciousness is just metaphysically fundamental, and we're just looking at parts of the brain that are just merely correlated with it. Sure. Or, or goings on in the brain. Like, well, which goings on in the brain are correlated with which mental state? Mm -hmm. And functionalism gives you an answer. It's the goings on that uh, uh, have the causal role associated with the mental state in question. Yeah, and and um, does functionalism, as I think it's historically, it was supposed to it's supposed to be a non-reductive physicalism, or or it can be cashed out that way. As a non-reductive physicalism, can the the NCCs be different in in my uh, brain than in yours because what it seems to me like what matters is just the the op, the inputs and outputs and in, in internal states. So even if the different NCCs in mine than yours for pain, that doesn't really matter, right? That's right. And in fact, it's part of what led people to the functionalist view mm. that they thought, well, pain can be multiply realized. Like maybe 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 for you and I, since we're both humans, maybe it's at least broadly similar what our neural correlates of pain are. Yeah. But there could be like, you know, maybe for an octopus or, or yeah. um, um, an intelligent, you know, a space or, or at least a, a sentient space alien that might be wired up really differently. They might not have C fibers at all, but they could still feel pain because right. they still had something in their well, well, sort of organism in their system that was mediating a transition between 
um, tissue damage and saying ouch. Of course, you you yeah. already see that like saying ouch is very like very like human and even English sounding. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, you get the idea. Yeah, or we could take a dog and it yelps or something. Yeah. 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 Um, so in a lot of my listeners will uh, be familiar with philosophy of mind type stuff. Are we able to to kind of chart the logical space of functionalisms here? Or are, so we have like uh, you know Putnam and Lewis and Armstrong. Whether those count as functionalisms or not, does ground functionalism? Do you in your mind? Do you can you place them between or somewhere in the logical space of functionalisms on offer? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so Parker, it's a great question, and that gets at like what I was saying. Like that functionalism is that there's this there's this connection, and I said like we have to say what <laughs> between the mental state and the functional role. Mm -hmm. So the um, if you go back to people like Lewis. Um, uh, they thought of the connection as analytic to the meaning of the term. They thought that what the, the word pain means yeah. is the state that mediates the causal transition from you know, tissue damage to saying, ouch, or you know, yeah. whatever that functional profile is. So they thought of the, the correlation as subserved by the meaning of the terms. Yeah. I'll call it analytic functionalism because it's about the meaning of the terms. Mm -hmm. um, and I can just I'll just say in passing, like um, with like all 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 due respect and all love to those theorists, it's a crazy view about the meaning of mental state terms. I mean, I think like what to the extent that I have any grip myself on what the term pain means, it's like a feeling. Yeah. Uh, ouchie fling. It's yeah. nothing about the meaning. Isn't about like a causal transition. Yeah. But okay. but, but that's that that's what analytic functionalism says. Um, so that's one sort of view um, that it's about the meaning. Then a, a second sort of view that may be useful to bring on the table here is a kind of dualist view that uh, Dave Chalmers is especially responsible for for uh, uh, reviving and developing uh, in, in beautiful ways. Um, and 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 Chalmers, at least in the in, in his uh, 1996 The Conscious Mind, had also had this idea that there were these that the neural correlates of consciousness were going to be you know, these functional correlates. Mm -hmm. um, but he thought it was merely a nomological connection. It's just a law of nature that happened to. Con so, so like, okay, you know, pain is for for a dualist, uh, for a property dualist, uh, which was Chalmers was proper his property dualist at that time. He is um, think of pain as you know, a, you know, fundamental property. Yeah, you don't have you can be a dualist and not think that pain's fundamental. So, this is an example. Of a sure, potentially fundamental property. And they think, okay, there's this fundamental property, pain, and there's this neural property, uh, uh, or sorry, there's this functional property of, uh, you know, subserving uh, or, or, you know, being causally intermediate between tissue damage and saying, ouch. Mm -hmm. And then there's just, hey, uh, a new fundamental law of nature that just says, oh, if you're in this uh, functional state, you're in that mental state. And it's a law of nature linking uh, distinct fundamental properties. Yeah. Is that is that is there a emergentism in, inherent in that, or is that just emergentism, or is that something else that, that not necessarily? So emergentism is one of these words that <laughs> everyone uses in a different way. Sure. So I think the only thing that I could say is uh, maybe. Or <laughs> if you want to talk like that? That's cool. We just okay. have you just have to have to tell me what you mean by emergentism. Sure. Um, I mean I would. I mean the Chalmers version I would say is straight up property dualism. Okay. Um. But the property, I think he, he spent so much time on supervenience in that book that I got to be honest, I, I skimmed that part a little bit, maybe too much. But I think he's, he still wants to say that the properties are, they, they supervene on the on the physical, right? But merely nomologically, not okay. metaphysically. Because remember, Chalmers thinks it's metaphysically possible that there are zombies. Right, 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 right. So there's a mental difference without any physical difference. Yeah. Right? The metal doesn't supervene on the physical um, across the metaphysically possible worlds. That's Chalmers. That's like part of his his big uh, uh, argument against physicalism is is based on this claim of a failure of metaphysical supervenience. Yeah, and that's that's all the big work that that zombies is doing to to motivate that. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, okay. So we got we got um, naturalistic dualism and we got analytic um, functionalism. 
And now we got grounding functionalism. All right, here we go. All right, so yeah, so this is to, to try to set the stage for ground functionalism as this kind of intermediate view, where the idea is the connection between the, the, the causal role and the mental state isn't, isn't, it's not analytic, it's not given by the meaning of the term. Mm -hmm. But it's also not a mere law, mere contingent law of nature, because that's the dualist view. Mm -hmm. The idea now, if we have sort of, you know, if we have grounding in our toolbox, is that we have these metaphysically rich connections that are stronger than laws of nature, mm -hmm. but are not subserved by the meanings of terms. They're rather, I think of these as laws of metaphysics, if you like. Yeah. So a good example, maybe, uh, arguably, uh, would be how parts form holes, or maybe how um, the members of the sat form the sat. Mm -hmm. So you might think, think that if you've got a thing like that was a classic example from from Kit Fine, that if you've got Socrates, mm -hmm. you've automatically got another thing in the world, the the set that has Socrates as its one and only member, Singleton Socrates. Yeah, singleton set, right? Yeah. 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 That's good. So the idea is that we have the idea in the set formation case is that we have this law of metaphysics, set formation, that says whenever you have some things, you have a set that has those things as uh, all and only its members. So when you have Socrates, a kind of degenerate plurality that just has one thing in mm -hmm. it, you have the set that has Socrates as its one and only member. Yeah. And the idea is that that's not just, a, it's, not, it's not like a contingent law of nature that a physicist is going to discover. But it's not part of the meaning of 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 a set because you can you can know the meaning of the term and not believe that there are any sets. So oh yeah, okay. Have have thought. Um, it's rather a, a a posited metaphysical principle. Mm -hmm. They say like, okay, I believe that there are things like Socrates, and I also believe as a substantive claim that there's this principle of set formation that when you've got things. Uh, there's a set that has them as its member. You have to be a little careful. <laughs> there, there are paradoxes lurking around set theory. <laughs> yeah, roughly, you have, a, you, have, you, know, you have a principle of set formation uh, as an added metaphysical principle. So the idea is that there are these metaphysical principles that are not laws of nature and are not given by the meanings of terms, but are just something else. Mm -hmm. Metaphysical, uh, just the way that the, 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 the root principles of what grounds what. Yeah. And the idea of ground functionalism is that the connection between the causal role and the mental state is is through one of these laws of metaphysics. Yeah. Um, the idea is that when, whenever you're in a state that's causally intermediary between tissue damage and saying, ouch, um, you're in the pain state, not by the definition of pain, not by a contingent law of nature, but by a metaphysical principle that... Um, and you can use emergence if you like here. Yeah. Uh, fine. Um, <laughs> so you can, think of, uh, you can think of pain as sort of emerging from as like a higher level derivative result of mm -hmm. the underlying neural structures or causal st structures even better. Yeah. And, and in going in for grounding, maybe instead of supervenance, this, is, this might get into like just some crazy morass, but... Um, do you still have interaction between mental? Like, is there still a type of interaction going on, or is that too much uh, dualism at play? I, I'm I'm worried that uh, not worried, but I, I'm just thinking of you know, is this epiphenomenalism? It's I know I'm pretty sure you wouldn't want to say that. Uh, no, uh, so we haven't yet said what happens with the causal relation. Oh yeah, this is just the laws. Great that... chain of being picture huh. where you've got sort where you've got grounding relations between your entities. Yeah. You could have the view, not not my view, but it's, it's logically possible to have the view that causation only lives at the fundamental level. Mm -hmm. And that, and, and if you had that view, that would mean that plus ground functionalism would entail epiphenomenalism because gotcha. because it would make the mental happen at, not at the fundamental level and so be causally inert. Yeah. Um, my preferred view is that causation can happen. You know, it, it, at the chemical and biological levels. So I, maybe the best thing to say, Parker, is that from uh, is that it puts mental states kind of in the same boat 
as chemical and biological states okay. as far as causal efficacy. They're all on this picture, um, non-fundamental, higher level uh, properties, entities. Mm -hmm. um, so if the chemical uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 substances or objects and properties, if they can be causally active, then the psychological ones have every bit as much claim to causal activity as the chemical ones do. Okay. Yeah, that's that sounds great. Um, another another uh, rabbit to trade to chase here. The the laws of metaphysics. I, I really like that language. Um, yeah, maybe it's not as important. Maybe you're just kind of throwing out that that terminology. But are the laws of metaphysics or metaphysical laws like this one, like the singleton set, like what we what we're using here for for ground functionalism? Are those grounded in the cosmos, uh, it, or or are they fundamental alongside? Well, what's the just? I know it might be pure speculation at this point, but what 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 are, what are the nature of these types of laws? Great question, really great question. I think they can't be grounded in the cosmos because the way that I'm thinking about grounding is grounding works when you have. Um, some uh, more fundamental entities and a, and a linking principle mm -hmm. from which the less fundamental entities derive. So like in the set formation case, you needed Socrates, but you also needed set formation yeah. to get singleton Socrates out. If you didn't have set formation, you wouldn't get anything out of Socrates, or at least you wouldn't get any sets out of Socrates and you get some yeah. other stuff. Um, but if you just had the cosmos and no linking principles at all, and you thought, oh, maybe I could get the linking principles out of the cosmos. Well, you wouldn't have any uh, laws of metaphysics yet to get anything out of the cosmos. Sure, yeah. So I think we actually have a powerful argument. This is something I've argued in a, a paper called Laws for Metaphysical Explanation. Uh, that at, le for, at least from this ground theoretic perspective, you actually have to take at least some of the laws of metaphysics uh, as uh, uh, brute and inexplicable. Mm. They, these, so I've sometimes I was uh, I use the phrase root principles. Yeah, uh, those are the like the going to be the basic laws of metaphysics, and there can be derived just like just like in the sciences, there can be der derivative laws. Um, so I think there can be derivative laws of metaphysics, but there have to be some basic ones from which the derivative from which the derivative uh, entities and the derivative laws are all uh, going to derive. Okay, well, that's fantastic. So, so uh, I think we can transition us back out of the rabbit hole. So, m m I think mind making is that what you would call this principle um, um, for making making minds? That's the connector between the, the inputs and outputs. Exactly. Um, is that in your mind? Um, is that a derivative law of metaphysics, or is that fundamental to the to the universe? So that's something that I'm officially neutral on. Okay. Uh, in the paper, although I will, I hope that it's not a fundamental root principle, but um, derives from some deeper principles. Mm. I actually think that um, ground functionalism has a very different flavor in in, in the mouth, to, at least to me. Uh, if mind making is a fundamental principle of the cosmos, then it feels like maybe not as physicalist as I, as I wanted it. <laughs> right, that's what I was thinking. Whereas if there's some more basic uh, uh, principle of uh, some more general functional derivation principle, mm -hmm. and mind making is just um, a kind of application of this more general functional derivation principle, then minds feel even less special yeah. in the makeup of the cosmos. And that goes, I mean, I think physicalism is this kind of cluster view, sure. uh, a, but like whether minds have like a special place in the cosmos or whether um, or, or not is like part of what goes in the cluster. And so, right. uh, yeah, the, uh, the specialness of the mind uh, uh, can partly turn on mm -hmm. whether there are root principles that um, make use of mental uh, 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 properties yeah uh, or invoke mental properties um, um, make, uh, or, or or whether that's just a derivative application well and that's what is so cool about your work is that you've you may have just elevated or through these through your work here elevated the conversation between a theist and 
a non-theist or a naturalist because now we have a new area to argue over. Is mind making a, is it fundamental or is it not? And if theism is true, it would make more sense for it to be more fundamental. If it's not, then it wouldn't make more sense. And so now we have a higher conversation where we can get in deeper to, to stuff. It, it, it's really cool that, that the conversation can go even deeper and even further now. Super cool. I mean, that's part of what I love about philosophy. And like, yeah. sometimes you just find these ideas that you just start playing with them and you start finding these like richer and richer connections. And uh, yeah, like we're onto something worth, worth continuing with us. Yeah. To get to these moments. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. So, so you have in ground function, in ground functionalism, you have a mind making principle. Um, is this, we haven't talked uh, a whole ton about like machine functionalism and maybe, maybe that is cashed out or maybe that is captured by analytic or naturalistic determinism. Um, any, any thoughts on like Putnam's machine functionalism? Cause it, it, to me, it seems like ground functionalism might be just machine functionalism taken further or explained more fully, but maybe you have a completely different view on that. Uh, huh. um, I'm not sure. I, to be yeah. uh, to be honest, I find Putnam hard to interpret. At certain yeah, he, he really I, is. Yeah, I'm glad to hear you say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Putnam's hard. I, I'm not yeah. sure. Um, yeah. I, he definitely did not have ground theoretic ideology. Okay. Um, so, yeah. I, um, okay. Well, th this might this might help me a little bit more too. Um, you you describe minds as more like ecosystems than mousetraps or or coke dispensers, and that that might kind of help us think through anyone who does have Putnam in the mind. If if you thought Putnam was more like a a mousetrap view or coke uh, dispenser, then maybe we could help. So can you can you explain yeah. what do you mean by ecosystems there? Oh, okay. Well, so the I'm not sure this will help with with the Putnam. Sure. Part. Maybe I, I don't know. Um, yeah. But um, the reason why I went into that is because things like mouse traps are in fact artifacts yeah uh, maybe this will be relevant to your to, for your theists um mm -hmm. uh where it's um we have a fairly rich understanding in metaphysics now of artifacts and artifacts are not to be understood purely in terms of their uh the cause to affect transitions that they mediate, but they're to be understood in terms of the, uh, at least in part, the intention of a of a creator. Right. So, like, if a if a bunch of like, if there's like a a tornado, and a bunch of little like splinters of wood and like metal bits, like just like get jammed together in the shape exact shape of a mousetrap. It's not a mousetrap. Right. Uh, it's like a, uh, it's just an accidental duplicate of a mousetrap because a mousetrap is, a, uh, it's like a, it wouldn't be a sculpture, or like a, wouldn't be a sculpture, wouldn't be a table, wouldn't be, a, no artifact can be made just from an accidental uh, a tornado. Um, yeah. And to get an artifact, you need someone who intentionally put things together to, uh, in a certain way. Yeah. Um, and so at least um, from a, uh, a non-theistic perspective, I didn't want the function, or maybe the, the functionalists shouldn't be committed to thinking of minds as uh, on the um, uh, template of artifacts. Yeah, we don't think uh, we, we don't, the functionalists shouldn't be committed to the idea that mi that a mind is a is a is a created artifact by a designer with an intention in mind. So, right. when, so I was sort of casting about for um, something else. That wasn't an artifact, mm -hmm. um, but that had this kind of uh, was such that it should be understood in terms of causal role. And so, ecosystems was where I went, where the idea was like being like a rain cycle. Mm. Um, that to to be a rain cycle is to be this kind of process, this causal process by which rain is. Um, you know, start anywhere and that's a circle. So it sort of, it falls down and it precipitates back up. Yeah. Goes around the circle. And so, so we have this kind of causal circle. And so a uh, rain cycle has this correlation with um, uh, this causal pattern. Okay. Yeah, that, that is really helpful. Um, I'm, I'm glad you brought up intentions a little bit because I, I did want to get into an intentionality and uh, mental states. 
do you um do you have any room or, or any any interest in in intentionality or do you say like that's maybe nice qualia and those kind of weird things too are cool but they don't really go into our explanation of the mind oh uh i i hope i have room for intentionality oh, sweet. <laughs> um I, it's, I believe it's there um, okay i better make room for it yeah um uh, to be honest, like in the ground functionals and paper, Parker, I was really more focused on consciousness okay. because that had been in large part through Dave Chalmers's uh, challenges to physicalism that had taken people had, had and still do. They still do take consciousness to be the big challenge to functionalism right. and intentionality. That's hard, too, but it's not like it's not what they call that. Uh, Chalmers called the hard yeah, problem. The hard problem. So I had consciousness on my radar as like, okay, let's try to see if we can solve the hard problem. Um, I'd love to make sense of intentionality as well. Um, I'd, I'd hope that a functionalist uh, account can also cover intentionality. Yeah. That would be, um, that, that, that would be the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'd have to come up with a, a new name for it. Um, there's, I know people keep generating, you know, the hardest hard problem and this and that. And, um, how, how about, uh, I have to bring up like Ned Block and, and maybe the Chinese room as well. Um, what, do, what do you make of those objections? And I, I think you'd say that, that ground functionalism can, can evade those uh, over, gener over generation objections and such. Oh, those are tricky objections. Great, great, they're great objections. So it could be that, like the whole, you know, the Ned, Ned, Ned's, Ned Box example is like the whole nation of China gets together and sort of enacts these functional roles, but it doesn't seem like the whole system is conscious. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's two options for a ground functionalist. There's the sort of pure stick to your guns. <laughs> Uh, bite and bite the bullet reaction, yeah. which is, and, and I, I'm actually, I sort of, people sort of, you know, you have this interaction, like, of course, the nation of China, of just the citizens behaved in certain ways, couldn't be conscious, but I think, like, well, actually, I'm not sure why not. Um, the only, I mean, there's a certain attitude that I sometimes have, well, the only things that we really know for sure whether they're conscious or not are ourselves. Mm -hmm. And people, when people talk, you brought up Philip Goff, when people talk about like panpsychist views, it's like, well, well obviously like, you know, rocks aren't conscious. And like, well, I, I, I kind of sometimes feel that way, but sort of like, well, I don't know. Who yeah. knows? Um, so I mean, I, Goff I, says, and he, he'll say stuff like, well, it's obviously not conscious in the same manner that we are. Um, sure. Right. And then when he, when he makes that note, you kind of go, oh yeah, I guess maybe. Okay. Yeah. So I guess I would say, well, we do know that we're conscious. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then it seems like our best, arguably our best scientific theory of um, what it is about us that puts us in a certain conscious state is functional role. Mm -hmm. And then like, okay, maybe this is, maybe there's room here to learn some things, some surprising things about which further entities in the world are conscious. That's yeah. the bite the bullet option. Yeah. Uh, and that's, I, I kind of moved to that as my preferred view. Okay, uh, but the other option, if you don't want to count the nation of China as conscious, or you're worried about like like Searle style Chinese room arguments, mm -hmm. and you come to the idea, and this is what Searle went in for, that consciousness or mental states generally requires the right kind of biological substrate. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's say you like the view that there should be biological restrictions yeah. on what sort of states can be conscious. All you need, you, you just need to build that in to ground functionalism. So you say that what grounds the mental state isn't just being in any state whatsoever that plays the right causal role. It's being in any biological state of the right kind. Yeah. Whatever you want that to be. Yeah. It plays the causal role. And now you've got a restricted like biological, like, like biological slash functional uh, theory of the grounding of mental states. So, uh, yeah. if you're if you're if you're more dead set against counting the nation of China <laughs> than the Ned Block example, that's that's probably where to go from ground functionalism to get that result. Yeah. Okay. And you just yeah, you just would be narrowing it down a little bit. I think uh, you give this option to uh, ground functionalism and biology. Biolo 
Gistism, I think, right? Uh, yeah, I don't, just the connect, <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Yeah, it either, but yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, well, when I'm I'm a, I'm a dualist myself, substance dualist myself, and I, it's, I know it's crazy today, but mm -hmm. when I when I do consider um, functionalism, sometimes <clears throat> uh, a lot of people talk about a disenchanted world for um, for a physicalist world. It's disenchanted. It's kind of sad. And when I think of functionalism, though, I think if the mind is just realizing, uh, you know, a certain uh, a, the realization of a certain machine table or, or um, a mind making principle, then it's kind of a magical world because uh, a wave could accidentally form, you know, for a second into a mind uh, because you have the right input. And in, uh, of course, super rare, but crazy things like that could happen and be really interesting yeah. to see what could actually realize. Like you said, the nation of China. That would have to be a you know a big uh, effort to to go into that, but you know crazy things could happen on this view, and I think that's kind of cool actually. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's I mean, it's super rare and stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be as disenchanted as as people um, come to argue for. I think one of the really cool things that's emerging out of a lot of different views in philosophy of mind is a lot of us start off with the kind of naive idea that like creatures like you and I are conscious and maybe some, you know, some animals are. And then like you said, well, exactly where, like where in the animal kingdom does like consciousness yeah. come in and out? That's a hard question. But then they think like beyond that, nah. Mm -hmm. And then like so many of the plausible views in philosophy of mind actually wind up putting the line elsewhere in terms mm -hmm. of like where, which sort of entities can be conscious and which sort of entities can't be. Uh, <laughs> I think that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, and so so your big takeaway here, or one of the big takeaways, I think, is probably mind making. That it is, um, it's a it's a metaphysical law that is realized in certain. Not even I don't know how complex they have to be, but it's just realized sometimes when there are minds, conscious minds, and it's this uh, realization of inputs, outputs, and internal states. Um. And is the whole thing. The inputs, outputs, and in, in states, is that the mind making? Where where does the mind making come in, I guess? Is it between the inputs and outputs? Exactly. Okay. So uh, I mean thinking of it on the model of of sort of like a mathematical function. Like yeah. we have like the, the you have like 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 you know, two plus three equals five, just to take a very trivial case. We think of plus as a function and it maps two and three as inputs to five as the output. Okay. So here the input is the systems having uh, states in a certain that occupy a certain causal role. Mm -hmm. uh, the output is the mental state, like pain or whatever. Yeah. And then mind making is that function like plus or set formation. It's the linking principle that says when you have this input, this is the output that you get. Okay. Um, I was, um, I didn't have this in mind when I was reading, but so uh, pardon me, I'm sure you probably mentioned it, but uh, what are mental states on ground functional? It, it, this, it, at first I thought maybe it was um, property dualism, but now I think after we're talking about Chalmers, you, you wouldn't go in for that. What, what, what is a mental state? Um, let me, just to make sure I'm tracking what, yeah. what specifically you're asking about mm -hmm. mental states, let's, can we turn to chemical states for a moment? Sure. Please, yeah. Uh, if you ask me what a chemical state is, I might just, uh, uh, I can tell you what makes for the worlds having certain chemical states, or I can't tell you, but like I can say that in principle, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's because uh, you know the physical state is such and such that we get uh, this sort of chemical state, you know, here in the world. Um, but I'm just helping myself to the notion. I'm not trying to reductively analyze okay. the notion of a cause. I'm just helping myself to the notion. Sure. And I'm just telling you when you get the chemical states. Uh, and yeah. that's how I would treat the mental states. So I'm not, I'm not going to try to give you a reductive analysis of cool. okay. you know, anything. But, okay. uh, you, know, like, you know, what does pain mean? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll tell you the answer. Yeah. Wait for it. Pain <laughs> means pain. Okay. Uh, and in general, actually, for most of the vocabulary in our in our lexicon, 
the only thing to be said as far as its meaning is the sort of simple disquotational account. Uh, there, there's a few uh, special exceptions when we can give a more informative account of the meaning of, 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 of a given lexical item. But yeah. generally, the best we can do is just, just quote. And in, okay. in this case, it's no problem because um, you, you, you know what pain is. Yeah, I'm really familiar with pain, yeah. So when I say that pain means pain, I've told you the meaning of the term in terms of something you understand. Yeah. So I guess it's not, it's actually, it's informative even. Um, yeah. And I'll say the same for chemical states, although we might have less familiarity with the meaning of, of those notions, but we, we, uh, we can come to learn them. And um, so that, so mental state is just what it is. Okay. Um, but I can tell you why. Uh, so the ground theoretic account, the idea isn't to say what, things mean it's to, we have we have these notions already or at least we can get them the point is to say why mm. we find uh, pain or certain chemical you know, molecules or other sorts of higher level structures so we're freely making use of these higher level notions and we're just asking for explanations for why the higher level structure of the world is like this rather yeah. than some other way Okay, so this is really helpful. I, one, one last thing, if I could ask uh, about just about consciousness. So, is consciousness in the same uh, category as what we just did with pain, where you're saying, "Hey, pain means pain," or is consciousness being explained by the the? Is it just it just is the function of inputs, mind making, and outputs? Oh yeah, it's not the. It's not just it. It's it's grounded in. Oh okay okay. But it's There's not the grounding. To yeah. Uh, so I, I was using, I've been using pain as just an example of a particular right. type of conscious state. Okay. But we can also just talk about consciousness generally. Right. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. More generally. And then I'm going to say, uh, consciousness, uh, this means consciousness. Okay. Okay. I'm not, not going to give you any more Oops. reductive. Yep. Sorry. Oh, no, I'm still here. Yep. Okay, cool. Sorry about that. Yeah. So um, no reduction so, here. Yeah. So part of the program, we didn't really get into this so much uh, previously. Mm -hmm. But uh, another thing that drew me into the ground theoretic approach to metaphysics uh, was the thought that conceptual analysis is a failed program. Mm -hmm. um, there are in the, you know, however, you know, um, 70 year, whatever, you, how many, for however many years, uh, philosophers have been at trying to give conceptual analyses of some of our key notions like knowledge, causation. Um, you know, some of the most brilliant minds yeah. have, you know, labored lifetimes trying to write out like, you know, C causes E, if and only if. And then <laughs> write out like a finite and intuitively satisfying set of necessary and sufficient conditions and uh, the program uh, just uh, uh, here's an, an inductively judging it inductively. Mm -hmm. It is a total failure. Yeah. We have not a single example of a successful analysis of uh, a core concept of interest, but rather yeah. the systematic cropping up of counter example after counter example every attempt. So yeah. I, I I take that seriously. Yeah. I, I'm not. I, I think I don't try to give conceptual analysis. Okay. Well, Dr. Sheffer, this has been so much fun and uh, it's really been helpful for me just connecting a lot of dots. And um, I, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. And I'm glad that you have picked things that other people have said were crazy and then just give a really good accounting of them and, and broaden the logical space and, and give people more stuff to work on. I'm really excited about um, mind making principles and, and, that conversation to continue and see whether they are fundamental or whether they're more derivative of something else. So just thank you for, for the work that you've done. And thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah. Thanks so much, Parker. It was such a pleasure talking about these issues with you. I really appreciated your engagement and your thoughts and that was awesome. Oh, thanks. And, uh, good luck. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Well, I wanted to ask uh, where can people find your work, uh, including this paper, if they wanted to read more of your stuff? Oh, right. So I, I have a website um, and it's, uh, Trying to remember now whether it's .org or .net. I think it's .org. Okay. <laughs> uh, www.jonathanshaffer.org. Uh, yeah. I think. Okay, and I can put a link in the description for everyone. Yeah, I'll I'll find it, put it in there. Yep. <laughs> awesome. 
Well, uh, this has been a really fun one, guys. Uh, this is going to have to do it for now, but uh, maybe we can get Dr. Shepard to, we can coax him to come back on and talk about more of his work because he's got tons of it. But for now, that's going to have to do it. Uh, this has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God.